It may be expected I should describe the number of men their war companies consist of, but it is various and uncertain. Sometimes, two or three only will go to war, proceed as cautiously, and strike their prey as panthers. In the year 1747, a couple of the Mohawk Indians came against the lower towns of the Chirake, and so cunningly ambuscaded them through most of the spring and summer, as to kill above twenty in different attacks before they were discovered by any party of the enraged and dejected people. They had a thorough knowledge of the most convenient ground for their purpose, and were extremely swift and long-winded. Whenever they killed any, and got the scalp, they made off to the neighboring mountains and ran over the broad ledges of rocks. In contrary courses, as occasion offered, so as the pursuers could by no means trace them. Once, when a large company was in charge of them, they ran around a steep hill at the head of the main eastern branch of Savannah River, intercepted, killed, and scalped the hindmost of the party, and then made off between them and Kiowe. As this was the town to which the company belonged, they hastened home in a close body as the proper place of security from such enemy wizards. In this manner did those two sprightly gallant savages perplex and intimidate their foes for the space of four moons in the greatest security. Though they often were forced to kill and barbecue what they chiefly lived upon amid their watchful enemies, having sufficiently revenged their relations' blood and gratified their ambition with an uncommon number of scalps, they resolved to captivate one and run home with him as proof of their having killed none but the enemies of their country. But contrary to the true policy of traitors among unforgiving savages, that thoughtless member of the Chocta Sphinx Company busied himself as usual out of his proper sphere, sent for the headmen, and told them the story. As the Mohawks were our allies, and not known to molest any of the traders in the paths and woods, he ought to have observed a strict neutrality. The youth of the town, by order of their headmen, carried on their noisy public diversions in their usual manner to prevent their foes from having any suspicion of their danger, while runners were sent from the town to their neighbors to come silently and assist them to secure the prey in its state of security. They came like silent ghosts, concerted their plan of operation, passed over the river at the old trading ford, opposite to the late fort, which lay between two contiguous commanding hills, and proceeding downward over a broad creek, formed a large semicircle from the river bank, while the town seemed to be taking its usual rest. They then closed into a narrower compass, and at last discovered the two brave, unfortunate men lying close under the tops of some fallen young pine trees, the company gave the war signal, and the Mohawks bounding up bravely repeated it. But by their sudden spring from under thick cover, their arms were useless. They made desperate efforts, however, to kill or be killed, as their situation required. One of the Chirake, the noted half-breed of Istanare town, which lay two miles from thence, was at the first onset, knocked down and almost killed with his cutlass, which was wrested from him, though he was the strongest of the whole nation. But they were overpowered by numbers, captivated, and put to the most exquisite tortures of fire amidst a prodigious crowd of exulting foes. One of the present Chukta traders who was on the spot told me that when they were tied to the stake, the younger of the two, discovering our traders on a hill pretty near, addressed them in English and entreated them to redeem their lives. The elder immediately spoke to him, in his language, to desist. On this, he recollected himself and became composed like a stoic, manifesting an indifference to life or death, pleasure or pain, according to their standard of martial virtue. And their dying behavior did not reflect the least dishonor on their former gallant actions. All the pangs of fiery torture served only to refine their manly spirits, and as it was out of the power of the traitors to redeem them, they according to our custom retired as soon as the Indians began the diabolical tragedy. The common number of an Indian war company is only from twenty to forty, left their tracks should be discovered by being too numerous. But if the warring nations are contiguous to each other, the invading party generally chooses to outnumber a common company, that they may strike the blow with greater safety and success, as their art of war is chiefly killing by surprise, confident that in case of a disappointment, their light heels will ensure their return to their own country. When a small company go to war, they always choose to have a swamp alongside them, with a thick covert for their shelter, 
because a superior number will scarcely pursue them where they might reasonably expect to lose any of their warriors. When they arrive at the enemy's hunting ground, they act with the greatest caution and policy. They separate themselves as far as each can hear the other's traveling signal, which is the mimicking such birds and beasts as frequent the spot, and they can exactly imitate the voice and sound of every quadruped and wildfowl through the American woods. In this way of traveling, they usually keep a hundred yards apart on the course agreed upon at camp. When the leader thinks it the surest way of succeeding against the enemy, he sends a few of the best runners to form an ambuscade near their towns. There, they sometimes fix the broad hooves of buffaloes and bears paws upon their feet to delude the enemy, and they will for miles together make all the windings of these beasts with the greatest art. But, as both parties are extremely wary and sagacious, I have known such arts to prove fatal to the deluders. At other times, a numerous company will walk in three different rows by way of a decoy, everyone lifting his feet so high as not to beat down the grass or herbage, and each row will make only one man's track by taking the steps of him who went before, and a gigantic fellow takes the rear of each rank and thereby smooths the tracks with his feet. When they are convinced the enemy is in pursuit of them, at so considerable a distance from the country as for themselves not to be overpowered by numbers, they post themselves in the most convenient place, in the form of a half-moon, and patiently wait a whole day and night till the enemy runs into it, and in such a case the victory at one broadside is usually gained. When they discover the tracks of enemies in their hunting ground or the remote woods, it is surprising to see the caution and art they use, both to secure themselves and take advantage of the enemy. If a small company be out at war, they in the daytime crawl through thickets and swamps in the manner of wolves, now and then they climb trees and run to the top of hills to discover the smoke of fire or hear the report of guns. And when they cross through the open woods, one of them stands behind a tree till the rest advance about a hundred yards, looking out sharply on all quarters. In this manner they will proceed and on tiptoe peeping everywhere around. They love to walk on trees that have been blown down and take an oblique course till they swamp themselves again, to conceal their tracks and avoid a pursuit. As we can gain nothing by blows with such warriors, it is certainly our interest, as a trading people, to use proper measures to conciliate their affections. For whether we are conquerors or conquered, we are always great losers in an Indian war. When the invaders extend themselves across the woods in quest of their prey, if they make a plain discovery, either of fresh tracks or of the enemy, they immediately pass the war signal to each other and draw their wings toward the center. If the former, they give chase, and commonly by their wildcat method of crawling, they surround and surprise the pursued if unguarded. However, I have known them to fail in such attempts, for the Indians generally are so extremely cautious that if three of them are in the woods, their first object is a proper place for defense, and they always sit down in a triangle to prevent a surprise. When enemies discover one another and find they can take no advantage, they make themselves known to each other. And by way of insulting bravado, they speak aloud all the barbarities they ever committed against them. That they are now to vindicate those actions and make the wound forever incurable. That they are their most bitter enemies and equally contemn their friendship and enmity. In the meanwhile, they throw down their packs, strip themselves naked, and paint their faces and breasts red as blood, intermingled with black streaks. Everyone at the signal of the shrill-sounding war cry instantly covers himself behind a tree or in some cavity of the ground where it admits of the best safety. The leader on each side immediately blows the small whistle he carries for the occasion, in imitation of the ancient trumpet, as the last signal of engagement. Now hot work begins. The guns are firing, the chewed bullets flying, the strong hickory boughs a twanging, the dangerous barbed arrows whizzing as they fly, the sure shafted javelin striking death wherever it reaches, and the well aimed tomahawk killing or disabling its enemy. Nothing scarcely can be heard for the shrill, echoing noise of the war and death whoop. Everyone furiously pursues his adversary from tree to tree, striving to encircle him for his prey. 
and the greedy jaws of pale death are open on all sides to swallow them up. One dying foe is entangled in the hateful and faltering arms of another, and each party desperately attempts both to save their dead and wounded from being scalped and to gain the scalps of their opponents. On this, the battle commences anew, but rash attempts fail, as their wary spirits always forbid them from entering into a general close engagement. Now they retreat, then they draw up into various figures, still having their dead and wounded under their eye. Now they are flat on the ground loading their pieces, then they are up firing behind trees and immediately spring off in an oblique course to recruit, and thus they act till winged victory declares itself. The vanquished party makes for a swampy thicket as their only asylum, but should any of them be either unarmed or slightly wounded, the speedy pursuers captivate them and usually reserve them for a worse death than that of the bullet. On returning to the place of battle, the victors begin with mad rapture to cut and slash those unfortunate persons who fell by their arms and power, and they dismember them, most inhumanly. If the battle is gained near home, one hero cuts off and carries this member of the dead person, another, as a joyful trophy of a decisive victory. If a stranger saw them thus loaded with human flesh, without proper information, he might conclude them to be voracious cannibals, according to the shameful accounts of our Spanish historians. Their first aim, however, is to take off the scalp, when they perceive the enemy hath a proper situation, and strength to make a dangerous resistance. Each of them is so emulous of exceeding another in this point of honor, that it frequently stops them in their pursuit. This honorable service is thus performed. They seize the head of the disabled or dead person and placing one of their feet on the neck. They with one hand twisted in the hair, extended as far as they can. With the other hand, the barbarous artists speedily draw their long, sharp-pointed scalping knife out of a sheath from their breast, give a slash round the top of the skull, and with a few dexterous scoops, soon strip it off they are so expeditious as to take off a scalp in two minutes. When they have performed this part of their martial virtue, as soon as time permits, they tie with bark or deer's sinews, their speaking trophies of blood in a small hoop to preserve it from putrefaction, and paint the interior part of the scalp and the hoop, all round with red, their flourishing emblematical color of blood. They are now satiated for the present and return home.